welcome back to Switch to Linux. And today we are, of course, going to talk about the cloud strike situation. Of course, uh, I go off to camp and uh, we have issues going on in our politics. And then I go off to a conference and the whole world shuts down due to Windows. <laughs> <laughs> go figure, right? But I did want to wait until Monday to go ahead and do a video, wait for a little bit more information to roll out about it, get some of my questions answered and things. And so what I want to talk about is first and foremost, this isn't going to be like a Windows hate video, uh, because yes, this issue did affect Windows computers, but it is not um, it is not something that that Linux is immune to. Some people pointed out that a cloud strike issue impacted Debian and one other distribution a couple years back. What I want to focus on is the trends in our current world that are problematic and looking at what we can do about it. And also, though, why my strategy mostly remains the same, because my strategy is very, um, uh, we'll use the word, it might not be a good word in our current uh, world, but very insular in that um, I'm insulated from a lot of the changes that happen outside of my overall office. That being said, we're not in a total perfect situation. I just had to push Endeavor OS updates and the latest Endeavor is, there's some serious issues I have with my system right now. My media PC is not as stable as it has been in the last years past. Most of that has to do with one application, which is mission critical, that still doesn't work. There's still not full fixes for it. I was able to get enough partial fixes to use it sometimes. But I do have that uh, mostly working now. Uh, I did have to force myself to switch over to Pipewire. There's some Pipewire issues on the system. So we're not immune to all of these things. And this is the nature of constantly upgrading software and things like that. And that's exactly what we saw over here. In fact, there's even an interesting parallel to how uh, CrowdStrike is able to work and how the uh, how Google's uh, Manifest V3 uh, differentiates itself. There's a slight connection between those, and I'm going to talk about that here and near the end. In fact, I'm going to write it into my um, notes right here so I don't forget to put it in there at the end of the show. So uh, with that, what, of course, happened, everybody saw the articles. There's about 165 bajillion articles about this. I grabbed this one because I had some bullet points just to bring you up to speed. So on Friday, actually, this technically started Thursday night, early Friday morning. Uh, those in Down Under in, in Australia were noticing that, hmm, every single business computer running Windows for every form of infrastructure seemed to have crashed. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Um, and so it was a major global IT outage. Of course, we've seen similar outages. They didn't, they weren't as impactful, but we've seen them when something like uh, there was, I think, a, a recent situation where I think something with Cloudflare had a little snafu. We've had AWS outages in the past. We've had uh, Azure outages in the past. And when these big cloud infrastructures, which are running each one of them about a third of the internet, goes down, it causes serious implications in the world. And that's really my point one. We rely too much on a centralized world. We need to move back to a decentralized world where an entire company isn't running a third of the Internet through its systems. That is certainly a, a point. We're going to get to that a little bit more later. Uh, U.S. airlines grounded all their flights. United, American, and Delta ordered global ground stops. Uh, Microsoft uh, had said they fixed the issue. Now, this was all impacting these Microsoft computers, so everyone thought it was a Windows problem. It wasn't. It was CrowdStrike. I might accidentally say CloudStrike through this. Um, uh, that's just a misstep. If I say that, it's, it is CrowdStrike. Uh, so my apologies. And um, CrowdStrike is a Texas-based company, which the problem is, isn't with Windows necessarily. It was a problem with this company. Unfortunately, they are massively used in the corporate industry. Um, Alaska said 911 services went down. Now, the curious thing about this, I was looking at some, some different things, and back as recently as September, this person just comments in on the Microsoft forums like, hey guys, uh, my Windows 10 antivirus changed without me asking, uh, and it changed to 
to CrowdStrike Falcon Sensor. Uh, there's no sign of it on my computer, nor can I open the app. What's going on here? Uh, this person here, the best guess is his system might have been set up as part of an enterprise. And of course, if the, uh, the security administrator for the uh, network changes your antivirus, everybody's changes instantly. And that ultimately was the fundamental problem is that this is a software package that is used as a security package. Now, how does this relate to Manifest V3, as I said it would? Not necessarily having anything to do with that, just a similar implication. The reason this deals with Manifest V3 in a way is that what Manifest V3 does and why it interferes with ad blockers is you have a separate program and then you can pull in this rules definition list. What Manifest V3 does is it limits the amount of rules lists you can have in that. Whereas under Manifest V2, they can have thousands and thousands and updating the rules list does not impact how the software runs. The problem with V3 is now they would have to push a new software patch every time you wanted to update the lists, which need updated almost daily. That is where the problem comes into effect. Well, the similar issue happens with CrowdStrike. CrowdStrike needs to run at a kernel level because it is involved in doing antivirus and other malicious detection. And since malicious detection is constantly ever changing and evolving, they have to have a means to roll things out quicker. But since CrowdStrike operates at the kernel level of the operating system, and there is a version for Mac and there is a version for Linux as well. Uh, it just happens that the botched update was with Windows. So to get an application that runs in the kernel, you need to be signed as the kernel driver. But since they were a reputable company, you know, managing most of the world, 8.5 million computers, according to Windows, it was just 8.5 million computers went down, guys. That's only one percent unfortunately it was the one percent that makes the economy run but that being said what happened is they were skipping the extensive tests required to push the software out and if a software package running in the kernel has a failure it simply causes a blue screen of death and that's really what happened, that they needed to do these daily updates they weren't able to update just a simple virus list or an ad blocker list v3 and so they had to constantly update the software but it took too long to get the to get the signed certificate for that so being a fast-paced innovative company they just decided to skip that step and push out an update and then instead of like google does when google rolls out a new software patch it rolls it out very slowly to non-critical systems first checking for issues and things like that even Windows does that to a degree. They roll things out slowly so that if there's a bug, it doesn't impact everybody all at once. CrowdStrike doesn't do that. They're just like, hey, here's a new update. Everyone change now. And that new update borked itself. And when it did so, it had a failure in an application running in the uh, kernel of Windows. And that causes a blue screen of death. That is ultimately what happened. It was the company trying to move too fast, not doing all of the protocols to get the kernel driver uh, signed, allowing them to push it out much quicker. And also it'll, they pushed it out to every system all at once simultaneously. That is a problem. Now, what does this tell us? I'm going to give you guys, everybody's heard the articles from here on out. I'm going to give you my thoughts and my opinions about uh, what is going on here. Uh, the, the ultimate issues, the ultimate take home messages. Number one, we rely way too much on third parties. Okay. Now, Linux does this too. We rely, like the entirety, you've seen the memes, the entirety of the Linux infrastructure is upheld by one little FOSS application with one little developer. And when that thing, if that thing happens, you're like, collapse, whole thing goes, that's actually kind of what I'm experiencing on uh, on Endeavor, that there is a software application I need and there is a component of that application that is developed by one guy and that one guy knows there's a problem and it's like, life is in the way, I will get to it as soon as I can. In the meantime, I have to put duct tape on my computer almost daily to make sure this thing still runs. I had to do a few manual patches of the system already and mm, that's the problem. 
we do oftentimes rely way too much on third parties. Now, in this case, everyone was relying on this one company. But if you look at it and say, OK, we need cybersecurity, there's only like three or four companies. Uh, it was CrowdStrike this time. What if it's the, the other company the next time? And then that just causes the whole world to go down and collapse. These are problems. We rely way too much on third parties. Now, the second thing is um, we trust way too much in automatic updates. This is one of the things I do not like about Graphene OS. This downloads and installs updates automatically without my consent. If there is a borked update and it renders my production phone render uh, useless, that is a massive problem for me. That will probably be the reason I stop running Graphene OS should I stop running Graphene OS because there is no way for me to say stop, okay? I don't have time right now to deal with a possibly borked up phone. Alert me there's an update. Let me research the guides. Let me make sure other people aren't complaining about it. And then when I have the spare moment, I'll push the button and install it. I do understand that there are times people will completely ignore that, forget about it, or not update it and be left to vulnerabilities. But there should never be a situation where we have this massive global push that updates automatically when people don't have the time to deal with it. We all live in a crazy busy world, and if you have a borked update, it should not impact my day. In this case, one company pushed a really fast borked update automatically, and everybody ended up suffering from it. And that was a serious problem. We put way too much trust in automatic updates. Now, the problem is some of these updates are addressing security and some of these updates are addressing new features. That is something we definitely need to parse out. We need to say, hey, here's your feature update. Here's your security update. Sure, let's do some security updates. Believe it or not, guys, I do not believe I'm going to say this. WordPress has figured this out. I Believe me, it's crazy. WordPress will do automatic security updates. It will not do a feature update. It has parsed them out. If I want the new feature updates, I have to go through and manually update my WordPress site. But if there is a known security patch that is simple to fix, they update those immediately. They have figured it out. We need to get to this point where we have more choices and options. If you're going to do some form of automatic update, it should be pure security only. Now, in this instance with CrowdStrike, everything that they're doing is effectively security only because they're just constantly updating the, the virus list. But instead of being able to update the lists independently of the application, they have to update them concurrently. That's going to be the problem we find with V3 manifest v3 and why it's going to break ad blockers uh, because of the number of endpoints that they can manage to do um, the last point i have here is we put way too much trust in third parties uh, we this is different from reliance uh, the reliance on the third party is how stable are the how the trust deals with who has access to all this information what Basically, people didn't know as our entire infrastructure was run on Windows computers, but those Windows computers were completely reliant on a third party that could get in there, push code, automatically adjust things. Well, what if a malicious actor got inside of there and pushed a back door into your system and nobody even knew it was there to begin with? They could have actually had somebody in there getting the back door stuff, collecting a bunch of data. Now, to our knowledge, that did not happen. Who knows? It could be happening. But that's the type of thing. That's what was behind the uh, the XZ bug in Linux, which people are saying, see, Linux has problems too. Well, the problem is that never made it into a single production version of Linux. Arch Linux was entirely unaffected entirely, and any system that was not reliant on System D was also completely unimpacted. So the, pro the problem is, is that that thing was pushed out. It almost made it in. It did make its way into a few uh, preview versions. It did actually, one of the first things to delay an Ubuntu release in a long time. But the point is, it did not actually make it into the software. The problem is we got to trust the people who are patching codes. We have to trust the people who are involved in it. This is why my OPSEC has remained mostly unchanged by this situation. I try as hard as I can not to rely on third parties.
I try as hard as I can to do as self-sufficient and self-reliant as I can. I try and do local first and then expand to cloud systems that I control next. Now, of course, if something were to go bad at DigitalOcean or Linode, I would have some critical infrastructure things in my office that also go down. But at that point in time, there's nothing else I can do. I can't exactly host all of the websites I'm hosting for people. I can't exactly run all my VPNs and things like that from inside my van on a mobile office that drives in and out of cell phone range. Okay. Um, so we have that relationship involved. The point being is that we have to look at services that do not rely some other third party getting involved in the mix. This is why uh, I'm not sure if they've changed it, but the last time I looked at at Bitwarden, I was thinking about doing a self testing a self hosted Bitwarden. You cannot create a self hosted Bitwarden instance without registering your self hosted instance with Bitwarden themselves, which means an alleged security company is keeping a record of my email address and possibly some other personal information. Well, I found that GitLab does the same thing. Obviously, I'm not going to do any work with GitHub, being that it is owned by Microsoft. Uh, I was considering doing like a self-hosted GitLab or something. You cannot even run a self-hosted GitLab without doing the same thing. You got to give them information. They got to give them permission to run their the server on your own software. No, nah, no, not interested. So I'm looking at other third parties uh, as well and other code. Does that mitigate the entire thing 100%? Eh, no, it doesn't. But what it does mean that I'm not relying on a central location, a central server for critical infrastructure as much as conceivably possible. That is the world we are in right now. And what we do know is that anytime a company pulls in some third party and is working on some third party situation like that, what we know is that those third parties are always the weak link in the chain. They're the weak link for privacy. They're the weak link for security. They're the weak link for everything. Because for a lot of situations, people don't even know they exist. You're just like, oh, I have great, great cloud security. Awesome. And it usually works well. Well, until it doesn't. And that is what raises its own concerns. So those are my thoughts. Number one, too much reliance on third party. Two, um, too much trust in third parties. Three, too much trust in automatic updates. I think I inverted a few of those, but that's okay. And uh, this is a very similar situation as we're seeing with, or we're going to see with Manifest V3. Uh, that might cause more add-ons to browsers to break because it's the same situation. They have to keep on recompiling the application itself rather than a standalone list. Where if, uh, if uh, CrowdStrike could do a standalone list instead of recompiling the whole application the whole time, it might actually work a little bit better, uh, run a little bit more predictably and reliably. That's just some thoughts that I have on this whole situation. Uh, let me know your thoughts down below. And uh, again, I know this might have surprised you, but this didn't have as much to do with Windows as it had to do with the third party. It's just that so many people people and enterprises use Windows and so many of them have used this particular company. This is not Windows fault. This is not Windows fault. That's the, the bottom line here. Uh, with that, guys, thank you for watching. If you like this type of content, please feel free to subscribe to the channel and we will see you next time.